Right. Let's see if that works. This one I know that was asking me to rationalize the um, numerator, and this one was probably the same the way I wrote it down, but I put the square root over. Chumba Wumba. But I think it was, I know, but I think it was rationalized the numerator on that one, and it was just really long and crazy, and I couldn't get it. Oh, oh, that's from one line, right? And that's the way it started looking, the 3,025 one? That's the way it started at the beginning? Yeah, that was, that was the problem. Okay, so. What's up? Do you have any band-aids? Do I have band-aids? Yes. No. Is there a firmly on camera? There is. I'm not where? sure if it's open. Where have they gotten to now? Do we know where the nurse's office is nowadays? Uh, you alright? What's up? It's great money. Oh! Uh, it's just a slip. It's fine. I think it's just fly. It doesn't look like it's actively bleeding. No. I cleaned it up in the bathroom. Oh, okay. Alright. Um, I haven't been in a nurse's station in a long time. Oh, it's fine. There's no. I have a first aid kit in my car. I'll see white till I get back on the Good they Lord. sell band aids at the um, bookstore. Mm -hmm. Oh, all right. Are they open? The bookstore, yeah. 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 All right. This is insane. <laughs> I'm going to find the nurse. Good Lord. <laughs> All right. Where is It's probably in, oh, that's where it is. It's got to be in the student center where the, where the cafeteria is. Way the hell over there. Oh, okay. Yeah. And can you do number 15 for 1320 when I get back? Yeah. Cool. All right. Remind me when you get back. Okay. That was exciting. Blood just gushing everywhere. It's crazy. All right. What am I up to? So this one said what now? Rationalize. The... I think it was the numerator. The numerator. That's why I picked the. So what can I do with this first? Reduce it. Yep. Yeah, reduce it. By five. Yeah, at least five goes into these big ass numbers, right? So if I divide this by five, just to cut to the chase, like it's six oh five. Uh, what can I do with the A's and the B's and stuff? How many A's will be left? Two. Two. On the bottom. Good, because one cancels, there's more down here, there'll be squared left down there. How many B's are left? Five. On the five. Top. top. And this one, if I divide by 5, I get 1205, I think. 12. Is it 1205? Shit, somebody help me out. 1225. 1225. Okay. So then you can divide by 5 again, right? Mm -hmm. One, who is it? 245 and 125. What's up? Like, we're, we're wondering if this question is the same as that. You can do the same thing here. Okay. Oh, and that one it says you can do the denominator? Denominator. Denominator. Okay, we'll do the denominator on this one. Okay. Uh, let's see. And 121 is 11 times 11. And does 11 go into 245? No. So I've reduced this as much as I can. This is disgusting as hell. Uh, five, now I want to break, why do I want to break this guy up? But what's kind of nice here? I mean, this is kind of a silly question here. Uh, what's the square root of a squared? Hey, so what I really have is, and what's the square root of 121? 11. 11, right? Because 11 times 11 is 121. So I get 11 
and I mean, I can, what happens with the bees? Two goes into five twice with one left over. On the bottom, I can take the A out, because square root of A squared is A. How are we doing so far? This thing is loaded. Uh, and then this guy, I want to break down so I can see, is there a two of anything in it? 49 right. and 5. 49 times 5? So what's the square root of 49? 7. Seven. And the square root of 5? I don't know. So that simplified down quite a bit. And now it should be relatively easy. If I want to rationalize the bottom, what does it need? What does the bottom need, the, that radical piece? What does it need? It needs another 5 because it's a square root, so it needs two things inside. It currently only has one. So I, if I multiply by square root of 5, top and bottom, that'll be good. If I was rationalizing the numerator, it just needs another b, so I would do square root of b instead, right? depending on which question they really ask, right? So on the bottom, I'll get, well, on top, I'll get 5b. On the bottom, I get 7a times 5, right? So that'd be 35a on the bottom. Cool. So the trick on that one was taking some patients, uh, having some patients and getting through the simplification first. And then it becomes a really, these parts you could just, you know, just sit in there. It's awesome. All you, wear, all you care about are the irrational parts. Yeah. It started off pretty disgusting. So I think it's the same thing as that. But this doesn't go into this one. Oh, okay. So. It does, I think. I'll see. Yeah. Yeah. How do I know that this will reduce? Because you know math, dude. No, how could I check? What number definitely goes into both of those? Three. Three. Nine, even. Yeah. Right. What's four plus four plus one? Nine. Nine. What's one plus zero plus eight? Nine. So I know nine goes into both. That looks like prime, maybe. But the bigger numbers get, the harder it is just to look at it and know it's prime. Trust me. So actually, 9 goes in because all the digits add up to be 9. It's a really useful little trick to know about 9s. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So if you were like not to reduce that, I know you showed that if you reach the reduces that and try to rationalize it, do we um, So then you break up the bottom and you see, just like we did this one. Okay. Yeah. You break up the bottom. And you see what you can do the square root of and what's left. Mm -hmm. right. Dying is in the 108. Mm -hmm. 12 times. Cool. And the 12's got a 4 in it, right? Mm -hmm. So there's 36 times 3. I don't know if you guys are coming with me. So a 3 can come out for the 9, and a 2 can come out for the 4. So a 6 comes out total. That'll still work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just won't be as simplified as my math I probably wants it to be. Okay. Yep. Thirteen twos are quadratic formula. 28? Mm -hmm. So be careful on this section. I graded somebody's, and they did all the work without using quadratic formula. This is the quadratic formula section. You probably want to use it a few times. Right. Um, the exception to that would be something like the one you're asking me right now, number 28. Because the instructions just say simplify or solve. So I, I understand to a point but you're in the quadratic formula section. You probably want to use it somewhere. It should have said solve using quadratic formula. But what do I, what do I always try first? Factoring. Factoring, yeah. And 36 and 49, what are special about those? They're squares. Yeah, so one of the first things I would try, and if this doesn't work, then I might go ahead and use quadratic formula. But I'm just going to see if this works. 36x squared would be... 6x, 6x, is that cool? 49 would be? Yeah. And I get 42. And so I know the first and the last works. So all i got to do is check the middle. What do I get here? 42x. 
42x, which makes there, I'm done. Uh, I mean, I'm not done. I'm done factoring, and now I can solve it. You guys see that? Now, if you use quadratic formula, what's a? What's b? What's c? Means 36. Means 84, and c is 49. Disgustingly huge numbers, but you know, just plug them in the right place, it should still work out. If I'm you, though, I might have some trouble. Uh, what is the answer? What are the answers? Or Yeah, yeah, so 6x yeah. plus 7 equals 0, so x is negative 7 over 6. You get the same answer there. But then go back. What's that power? You remember Jeff said you had to have that many answers? Yep. You do. You have two answers. They just happen to be the same number, right? That's negative 7, 6. That's negative 7, 6. So you actually do have two answers. We call it a multiplicity of two. It shows up a multiple of two times. It shows up twice. You guys kind of with me? So it still makes sense. If that's a square, you better have it, uh, a total of two answers. And I do. They just happen to be the same answer. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Can you do it with a quadri quadratic formula? Because I got sure. positive 7 over 6. All right. Let's see. Uh, so what's the quadratic formula? Negative B. Negative B. Plus or minus 2A squared. B squared, 4 over 2. 2A, two cool. I like it. Right, if you look up on YouTube, you can find a nice little song. I don't do songs. songs. <laughs> you guys can go find your own song. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whatever helps. And now you just plug and chuck. I just throw in what you know. So B is. Negative 84. Yeah, 84. So negative 84, give or take. 84 freaking squared minus 4 times 36 times 49 all over twice 36. Mmm, yummy. Oh, baby. So then you get, uh, that still is creepy, Joe. Yeah. So 84 squared is 7,056? Yeah. All right, sounds about right. Minus 7,056. Now, now think about it. If the radical, if the radical piece is anything except zero, you will get two distinct answers. Let me say that again. Since this is this plus or minus this, if this is anything besides zero, you will get two distinct answers. That plus that over twice a, that minus that over twice a, and they can't be the same, can they? Because one of them is adding and one is subtracting. We got the same answer twice. The only way that could happen is if this guy is zero. Then the plus or minus piece is gone. Gone. So that makes sense. So that piece is zero. So I get in negative 84 over twice 36. And then you reduce that a few times. Twice, two into that goes 42 times. I can divide both of those by 6. So I get negative 7 over 6. Same thing we got there. Thank God. It better be. So question. So for like the example 21, that's exactly like that. But the number that goes into the negative B spot, is going to be a negative number. Good. It's already negative, so would that make it a positive? Beautiful. You plug it in? Look at this as saying the opposite of B, plus or minus, because that's, uh, that's what the negative sign means. It means the opposite of it. Okay. So if B is negative, it becomes positive. If B is positive, it becomes negative. negative. Cool. I like it. I like it a lot. But that's definitely one that I would let it go if you factored it and solved it. But dear God, use quadratic formula on the rest of them, right? That's the quadratic formula section. It's kind of a giveaway. What should I do? Oh, yeah. I'm in the quadratic formula section. I should probably do that. You guys doing all right? Hmm. Some things are easier than others. Yeah, this is true. Okay, three week 103 is one of the harder ones. Nice. You get a shirt when you're done with this, at least. Really? This. Oh, you should. I didn't, I didn't promise anything. For 13.1 on page 807, 
Oh, good. All right. So uh, this problem relates to that question because there are three things that, that can happen. What this is really saying is, when is this parabola equal to zero? So there could either, if I have a parabola sitting there, there could either be two places where it equals zero, right? Do you guys see that? There could be two places where it equals zero. Yeah. You guys with me on that? Does that make sense by itself? Mm -hmm. What else could happen? No places. There could be no places where it equals zero. Or there could be one place where it equals zero. That's what happens there. That would be when the vertex sits on the x-axis, where it just touches once. So they give us a picture of number 10. They have a picture like this. How many uh, solutions are there for this equals zero? There's two solutions, one, two. So all it's asking you to do is tell me the number of solutions. It doesn't say graph it. It doesn't say solve it. It just says determine the number of solutions. So how many solutions? There would be two. How many solutions here? No. None, because there's nowhere that it's equal to zero. Right? So when I set something, a function, equal to zero, that's the same thing as finding the x-intercepts. Because I make y zero to find the x-intercepts. Right? So that's why visually, the number of solutions to an equation equals zero is the number of x-intercepts that I see. So that's why that had one answer, is because this guy would look like that. You'll only be touching the x-intercept okay. x-axis at one place. That's why I got one answer. Repeated twice, but still just one answer. And, and now, I mean, does that... So if I have a cube... If I have a cube, it could look like this. That's the freakiest a cube could look. So at most, a cube equation... Could have, yeah, see that, and see how that relates to what I keep saying about the degree tells you how many answers. So if, if uh, what if it looked like this instead? What if it looked like, whoo-ha, it's got one real answer and two complex answers. Oh, yeah. That's how it all comes together. It's very interesting. If, the, if it's not a real answer, it must be complex. That would be like the quadratic that's got that. Its answers would have I's in it. It's got no real answers, so it must have two complex. It has to have two answers. If they're not real, they are imaginary, complex. All right. Whatever you say, John. Okay, okay. All right. Anything else from homework? Oh, yeah. Um, 12.745. Ooh, yeah, I like this one. You would, Jeff. Bridge expansion. So, normally the bridge is like that, but then during the summer, it expands by a foot. So, this is a mile long. A mile is how many feet? I mean, no. Like 5,062 or something. All right, that's close. Yeah, so 5,280. So I would make everything in terms of feet because the amount that this increases is two feet. It increases by two feet in length when the summertime because it heats up. So the metal, of course, expands. And that's why a lot of bridges have those little connector dudes that have some space between them, so it has space to grow, so the whole thing doesn't buckle and break and throw you down into the sea. And who knows what happens to you after that. So what they're asking is, what's the height of this? How big would that bulge be if nobody built in room for the bridge to grow? It's way bigger than you would think. Right. So this used to be a mile from here to here. How, now how long is it from here to here? 5282 feet, right? Because it grew by two feet. Doesn't seem like much. 
So where's my right triangle? It's what I'm pretty much always looking for when I'm talking about side lengths of a triangle. Where's there a right triangle? If you take half of it. Yep, good. So this much will be what it used to be, cut in half, right? This distance here is a mile, so half of 5280. Cool. And how much is this here? It was one mile, right? Oh, it's a two-mile bridge. Spy guy. Jeff. Right in the middle of that, I realized it's not a one-mile bridge. It's a two-mile bridge. But uh, we can salvage this. So it's a... So it's a two-mile bridge total. So this would be one mile... This would be one mile plus one foot, so 5281. Because the whole thing grows by two feet, so one extra foot there, one extra foot there. So they're assuming the bulge is going to happen right in the middle. In reality, who knows what would happen to this poor bridge. So this looks like this couldn't be that much, right? Now, once you get that set up, it's easy from there. They're large numbers, but who cares? You got your calculators. What can you use to figure out this? H squared plus 5280 squared equals... Yeah, H squared plus 5280 squared equals 5281 squared. Yeah, cool. So when you do that, you should get, I think it's like 100-something feet. So the bridge increases in length by two feet, and it has to, it's like, it goes like that. That would be 100 feet tall, if oh, I remember wow. correctly. That's crazy. Isn't that crazy? So thank God they figured that out and built in some room for it to grow, right? <laughs> Oh, yeah. And they do more than just that, but that's the least they do. That one, it was hard just to figure out how to draw the picture. Plus, they had miles when you really want to, and you want to have, and then they said feet, and you, you want everything in the same units to be able to work together, right? Okay. So that's number 45, section 12.7. Thirteen point eight, page eight sixty four. Um, number fifteen. Thirteen point eight. Number who? Uh, fifteen. Oh yeah. All right. Cool. What well, you doing? It? Yeah. What was the one you had a question about? Uh, Thirteen point eight, number fifteen. Dude, your your timing is amazing. She just asked that question. Cool, because I hate that question. <laughs> <laughs> Now, me, of course, I love that question. Uh, all right, so they bend the long side of a 8 inch by 14 inch sheet of plastic along two lines form a U shape. Okay. So it starts off 8 by 14, and they're going to bend it up. It looks like out here. Um, yeah, that's what I have to assume. Blah, 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 blah. Bending the long side of an 8 inch by 14 inch sheet of plastic along two. Yeah, okay. So they bend it and it ends up looking like this here. Let me just look straight on. So this way, this would be 14. Actually, let me see if I can't handle some 3D. Yeah, that's overly bad. Alright. Roughly. It's not bad. Horrible, but alright. You can look at the book to get some more 3D. Uh, so they bend the, the sides up and they make this shape for a gutter. Right? In fact, I said something about making a gutter when we were talking about this problem. So can somebody tell me, uh, so, so I bend it by X. This, this is X. So if I bent it up by 3 and 3, how much would be left here? If I did 3 and 3, how much would be left there? 8. How much did I bend it, though? I bent it by x and x. So how much is left here? No, 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 no. If I bend it by 3 on each side, it's not 14 minus 3. It's 14 minus 6 because it's each side. So if I bent... 
each side by x, how much is left? There was 14, but I'm going to take away two x's. And how long is this still? Eight. Eight. Cool. Okay. Woo! Awesomacious. Uh, let's see. How tall should the file be in order to maximize the volume that the file can hold? Oh, that's always not a gutter. Okay. So what is the volume of that thing? What is the volume of, of a box? Yeah, length times width times height. Length times width times height would be the volume of something. All three dimensions come into play, right? Area is length times width. Multiply by one more dimension to get volume. So volume is length times width times height. What's the length? Eight. What's the width? And what's the height? X. If you multiply that out, what kind of thing will you get? Not what will you get, what kind of thing will you get? It will be quadratic, right? It will be x squared. You'll have an A and a B. And they're asking you to maximize the volume. So if I say find the maximum, find the minimum, find the most, find the least, that kind of thing, you know it's going to be, I want to get an x squared equation so I can use something. Now let me slow down here. So they gave you this picture, you just had to kind of label it. And you can always give yourself a real situation. Say, if I would have bent this by 2, it would have been 2, 4, so there would have been 10 left here. It's always twice what you bend it by that you take away. Then you have to know the volume equation to kind of move forward with this. So let's see now. Will, help me out. So you say, what do you get when you multiply that out? Yeah, so if you multiply that in, that in. Yeah, 112x yeah, minus 16x squared. Plus, if I graph that, what would it look like? Parabola. Parabola. Opening which direction? Down. Down. So if I graph this, it'll look like that something, right? So I'm trying to find the maximum volume. So that's another way to say that is to find the, the what of the parabola? Vertex. vertex. Cool. How do I, what's the quickest way to find the vertex? It's negative v over 2a. Yes, this is a remarkably useful thing, the negative v over 2a. Remarkably useful. All right. And what's, now you've got to be careful. What's, neg, what's b? 112, good, because this is out of order, right? right? So negative 112 over twice, negative 16. And then whatever the hell that is. My one skill, I gotta show off every now and then. That's one of my favorite problems right there. But see, uh, it's all about using what they tell you. They tell you this. Use what they tell you, and then what they ask you, they ask you about the volume. So then I wanna plug what they tell me in what they ask me, simplify it, and then it's gotta be quadratic, because that's all we can handle. When you get, if you ever got to calculus, you could handle, who cares? You could handle any type of function. For us, we have to have a quadratic, because then it's very easy to find its highest point. The vertex is really easy to find. I have a question. Yes? Why would it, why would it be 14 minus 2x? So if I, bent, uh, if I bent this up by 2 inches, that's like the x here, right? Mm -hmm. If I said, not, let me not use x, let me use 2. How long would this be here, the leftover there, if I bent it up by 2 on, on both sides? 14 minus twice 2, right? So 14 minus twice x, because x is the amount I'm bending it by. So it's a smart idea to put a real number in for x for a second. See what your brain does. Your brain will latch right onto it and go, I'm going to do the same damn thing for x. I like that. I would be for every problem.
Yeah, for most word problems, you can just plug a nice number in for the unknown and see what you do with it. Yeah, and they do the same thing with X. Yeah. Anything else from homework? So, how much homework? Huh? 42 and 13.2. 42? Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, this one gets people. Because they're not asking you what g of 1 is, right? So 42, or f of 1. 42's got this bad boy here. This is section 13, 2. Mm -hmm. And they ask you, uh, what makes f of x equal to 1? And the big mistake I see is people do f of 1, and they just plug a 1 in. Well, that's easy. Well, it's not they're asking. What are they asking? They're saying, what makes f of x equal 1? So what can you replace this with? What is f of x? 7 over x. That's f of x, and I want to make it equal 1. So I just replace f of x with what it is. And how in the hell do I solve that? Yeah, beautiful. This is old news, right? The new part of this is going to be, you probably have to use quadratic at the end, whatever section we're in yet. So how, what does this guy need? Who? Mm. X plus four. It needs X plus four, yeah. yeah. So you can't just do this, right? No. I know you want to, but you, you so desperately can't, right? One half is not the same thing as five over six. Are they equal to each other? Hell no, I can't add to something. I can only divide or multiply by something, right? So he is missing him. Aw. And he is missing X. Yeah, X. Good. And what's he missing? All of them. Everybody. He misses everybody. That's another, that's the second biggest mistake, is people just leave that as one. It makes the problem really easy. It's always easy to get the wrong answer. So not that always. Sometimes it's really hard to get the wrong answer. Yes, sir? It was in the problem. So, so what's my next step? Why did I do that? Okay, how do I do that? What's my next step? I made all the bottoms the same so that I can... Yeah. I can multiply by x times x plus 4 everywhere, and it cancels, bam, bam, bam. So I'm left with 7x plus 20. All right, who asked that question? Who asked that? Did you get that far? Mm -hmm. You did, okay. You guys with me? So everything you've ever learned before could show up at any time in any problem in the section you're looking at now. And that's, that's the bottom line about math. Math doesn't suddenly say, I'm not in that section anymore. No, it's just everywhere. The difference here is before it had to come out to be something factorable, because that's the only way we knew how to solve these things. Now it can come out to be any damn thing it wants to be. We can get imaginary numbers now. Shit. So, of course, what do I have to do? Combine All right, combine like terms. Move over the x one and the y. Yeah, what tells me what to do next? What part of this problem tells me what to do next? X. Yeah, that tells me I have to get it equal to zero. zero. Good, good, good. Y'all seem more deflated than normal. So let's see, we get x squared plus, not minus plus, but minus, minus 10x minus, 20. minus 28. Is that factorable? Hell no. no. 
Well, makes sense, I mean, considering what section we're in. But don't assume it's not going to be factorable. This is definitely not factorable. There's no factors of 28 that make 10 any way I want to look at it. Right? So what do I have to use it? Quadratic. You could use completed square, you could. But this is the quadratic formula section number one. If I put this problem on the test, you could do it either way you want to. And normally quadratic is going to be easier. This one, completed square, might be about as easy because 10 is easy to work with, or a half a 10 squared, that kind of thing. Some of you guys are with me. But I can just go ahead and use quadratic formula. Bless you. Bless you. What's A, what's B, what's C? A is 1. B is negative 10. C is negative 28, and then I can throw it in. All right, you can sing the song if you want to. Whatever. Sit by yourself during the test so you can see the song or the song. I, I mean, is that... How, did you get that far? Yeah, I just saw my mistake. What's up? Um, when I was subtracting the... When, when you asked the first time how far I got, when I subtracted, I subtracted it wrong from the side. Oh, okay, okay. So, so I you got, got the wrong I, numbers. I got different numbers. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. So now you just got to throw it into a negative e plus or minus. You can do that. All right, so negative b, what's b? So the opposite of negative 10 is 10 plus or minus b squared 100 minus 4 times a times c. The next big mistake is, see how these two negatives should make a plus? Mm -hmm. Somehow, for some reason, it's for some people, it stays minus for the next step. But that should be 100 plus whatever the hell that is, right? This is all over twice A, which is 1. And, and you know, so what, what do you get inside there? 100 plus this, and what is 4 times 28? 112, good. So it's 100 plus 112. 212. And then you just got to try to break that down. Uh, it looks like 4 is going to go in there at least, and 4 is square rootable, right? You got to try to simplify that radical. That's the last thing you do. Just try to simplify whatever's left in there. You can reduce the 2 to the 10 then, right? Not yet. If you break it up, sure. Yeah? Where did you get squared by square? Where, sorry? Plus, plus there, right? From there, because the one needed is over one, so it needs both an x and an x plus four. Yep. Well, you, you can't just do this. You could break it up. Oh, it's kind of how the book tells you to deal with it. Okay, cool. That works. That is one method to do it. I like it. And then you don't make that mistake, because if you do this, and then that guy escapes being divided by 2, that's not fair. Why did he get cut in half when he did? That doesn't make, that's not nice. But now you can simplify this and reduce it. Yeah, this one is just 5, but this one you can simplify. At least 4 goes in there. You guys are despondent, but you're not completely <laughs> devoid of hope. I have to crush the rest of that somehow. Oh. Okay, I got waves. I got this far. I got waves. Watch you with your head on your desk, there's a jewel coming up. Well, I've almost got you there. Homework. Anything else from homework yet? Fourteen one? Thirteen one. So does that just look like that two twelve that you just pull out a two then and that becomes fifty three inside? Yeah, you can split this up as four times fifty three. Good. So the square root of four is two and the twos can cancel. So you're left with five, give or take root fifty three. Because you would 
four square root fifty three. Oh, and then you can cancel the four and the two. Okay. Well, the t yeah, that'll become two out there, and the twos will cancel. Yeah. Um, Will, which one did you say again? 65? 65. Okay. So 65 says, complete the square to find the intercepts. To find the x-intercepts. And, I mean, just to look at it, can you factor that? No. Hell no. If it was a minus 70, you could. Because then it could be 7 and negative 1, and that makes 6, right? But 7 and 1 makes 8. Too damn bad for us. I can't factor it. But I couldn't even factor anything. They, ask, they tell me exactly what to do. Uh, finding the x-intercepts. How do you find x-intercepts in general? You don't plug in 0. If you plug in 0, you get the y-intercept. If you make x0, you get the y-intercept. I have to make y0, which is what f of x is, right? That, that guy took the place of y, remember that? So that's, that's why quadratic formula and stuff, that's why they find x-intercepts, because if I solve equal to 0 equation, I get the x-intercepts. That's how I find x-intercepts. So the quadratic formula will find the x-intercepts for a quadratic equation. That's what it's for. But this one didn't tell me I can use quadratic formula. I have to use the long cut, which is completing the square. How the hell do I complete the square? What do I do? Take half the middle term and square. Good. What's the very first thing I want to do, though? Move Make some root. So let me subtract the 7. Yeah, so your two steps are? Divide by, by, divide by, by 2. Two. I like it. And then square the answer. So where's that 9 go? Line. That's what I need to add here. If I add it here, I better add it there. So I get 2 equals, and how does it factor? Like that, right? Well, that was easy to factor anyway. Who cares? You don't need that. Now, why the hell did I do that? I love it when people get there and then they square it out. I'm like, ah! <laughs> no, why did we do that? Why did we just do all that work? So we can get out of What can I do now? Go to square both sides. No. no. Be careful how you say it. I think I know what you mean. The opposite of square. Square root. Square, square root. root both sides. Yeah. And when I do this, plus or minus. Plus or minus. It's got to just be second nature, just to capture both answers. We square rooted y. So I can kill the square that's got my x stuck. If I kill that square, now my x is not stuck anymore. I can solve for it. So we get plus or minus rad 2 equals x plus 3. Last step, subtract 3. That's how I get x by itself. Yeah, minus 3 minus 3. So negative 3 plus or minus <coughs> root of 2 is x. Gruesome. And I really want you to understand... This is the exact answer. As humans, this doesn't mean a damn thing to me. So don't feel like you're missing out if you're like, what is negative 3 plus square root of I don't know. Shit. you got to put in what square root of 2 is and see what the two answers are approximately, right? Again, I wouldn't say I live negative 3 plus square root of 2 miles away. I'm like, Who are you, Spock? What the hell? So, so, you guys see what I'm saying? Just in case anybody's worried about that, that is a number. It's just a weird way to write the number for humans. Figure out what square root of 2 is to a couple of decimal places, put them together, and you can see what the numbers really are, right? That doesn't mean much to us, and it shouldn't. Don't feel like you're missing out on something if you're like, okay, I got that. I don't know what the hell it is either. Just looking at it, i got to plug in what square root of 2 is and see what it is, right? Maybe I... So on my math lab, it makes us specifically say plus, comma, minus, like get... Oh, okay. Will it, will it be okay in the test to just do Yeah, you can just do like, like that. that. Yeah. Thankfully, I'm a human. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad to. My AI is pretty good. I fool everybody. So, I'm a little bit better in my math lab interpreting what you mean. That's the problem with online homework, and it will forever be the problem. And the minute they figure it out, that's when humans are obsolete. We'll all die. It'll take over. 
Because you can't look at something and figure out what you mean. That's what a computer can't do. Not yet. Not yet. We're getting close. It's freaky. Oh, it's very freaky. Anyway, it was... <laughs> All right. So let's get back into where we were. Um, do -do 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 -do. Last time we just barely got the 14.1. Uh, so if you started doing the homework, you're like, what the hell? We didn't talk about this shit. Well, probably not. We just barely got the 14.1. Um, so the first thing in 14.1 is the composition stuff, the, the fog function. Remember that? The F. OG. And the better way to write that was, was what? The better way to write that. What does that thing mean? F of G, yeah. So F of G of X. So what's a little bit better? I'm plugging that function into that function. Remember that stuff? We did that last time. Okay, cool. It's not that big of a step from what we were doing before with functions. Uh, your first step is just replace G with what it is and then throw that whole thing into F in this case. So I want to devote this rest of the time to uh, the next couple sections. And, and to finish out 14.1, it's going to be the idea of an inverse function. We obviously already know a lot of inverse functions. And what does that word mean, inverse? Opposite. Good. I like it. So sometimes you think of inverse as being flipping something. That's one way to think of it as being opposite. But another way to think of it of being opposite is to change the sign. But actually, this is even more general than that. This is the inverse of a function. So the inverse of the a function that does this. What's the inverse of this function? What does that function do? Yeah, it doubles something, right? So what would its inverse be? This is how we represent the inverse. So what the inverse of twice x? What would the inverse be? What does your gut tell you it's got to be? No, no. What's the opposite of multiplying something by 2? Dividing by 2. Now, if I said, what's the opposite of adding 2? What's that guy's inverse function? Subtract 2. I mean, that's amazing. That is groundbreaking. Yes? This is still 14.1. Yeah. Now, what I want you to realize is we, we don't know that many functions, really, yet. So that's why this is less than impressive. But every time you learn a new function, and you know about 1% of the functions that exist, every time you learn a new function, you have to also learn its inverse. Why? What the hell, man? Why do you need to know that? How do you solve equations? How do you solve an equation? You always have to do the opposite. You have to know what the inverse is in order to solve the equation. You guys, If you didn't know if subtraction existed, you could never solve x plus 2 equals 7. You never could if you didn't know subtraction existed. Right? So if you learn a new function, you have to learn its inverse also so that you can solve equations with it inside. So you can kill it. So if I have this equation, what's the inverse of uh, square root? Well, let's do something better. I'm sorry. Let's do cube root. You'll see here later why. i got to be careful. What's the inverse of cube root? Cube. X cubed. I love it. And sure enough, how do I solve this equation? I cube both sides, right? Why do you cube both sides? Because that's going to kill the cube root because they are inverse functions. So we already know inverse functions. I just haven't really called them inverse functions. We haven't used this symbol before. Be really careful. This does not mean flip it. This officially means the inverse of g. So you can't just make it 1 over x plus 2. That doesn't make any damn sense. Addition should go to subtraction for the inverse, right? So this does not mean flip it. Just another unfortunate choice of symbol. Right. So the negative one means inverse. Negative one uh, power, sort of like power. It means inverse. Exactly. Take ass. So how we do this, of course? This is not a new idea, but now that we've put that idea out there and said, "Oh, we've been using this idea forever. Let's use it more directly. Well, let's use it visually first. Okay. 
guys are so excited. Uh, so let's say I'm given some function f of x. I'm given the graph of it. It looks like this here. Can somebody tell me, uh, I didn't tell you what the function really is, did I? But I gave you a lot of information. I told you all the outputs of the function. So first thing, can somebody tell me what the domain of the function is? What's the smallest x value I can use? Negative 2. And what's the biggest one? 4. Is that an arrow or is that a dot? Does it keep going in both directions? No. So the domain is the collection of all the x values I can use would be negative 2 to 4. What's the range? Negative 3. Yeah, negative 3 to 3. It's always smallest to biggest. So negative 3 to 3. All right, you guys remember that? So domain is all the x's I'm allowed to use. So I can just see it. If you give me a graph, I can just see all the x's that go somewhere. And then I can see all the y's that are where the x's go. So can somebody tell me some values that I know this function goes through? Zero, negative one. All right, it goes through zero, negative one. Negative two, three. Negative two, three. Two, negative two. Four, negative three. Cool. So that's what that function does, right? And let me say this a little bit in a weird way. Uh, if I had that function, what would you say that function does to 8? What does that function do to 8? It makes it become what? 2. 2. Do you guys, so you guys understand when I say that weird way. If I plug an 8 in, I get a 2. But I can say it makes 8 become 2. So this function makes negative 2 become 3. It makes 0 become and so forth. So what must the inverse function do? Reverse. Yeah. It's got to reverse it. So if I gave the inverse function 3, it would undo what was done to it. So if f made negative 2 become 3. So if I give this guy 3, it's going to become negative, negative 2 again, you guys. Because it does the opposite, right? Whatever the hell that function did to negative 2, that's going to undo it. That's the basic idea of an inverse function. So if this guy ends up at 3, the inverse is going to take it back to negative 2. So, Phil, what's the rest of this going to look like? Negative 2, 2, negative 3, 4. Cool. Right, let me stop right there. I mean, that's hopefully it makes complete sense. The inverse function will undo whatever the original function did. That's what an inverse function is all about. If, the, if this function added 5, that's going to subtract 5. So it'll take it right back to where it was. What does this look like if I graph it? Of course, I end up with my graphs in the opposite colors, but oh well. 3, negative 2, right? So 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, negative 1, 0, negative 2, 2, and then negative 3, 4, like that. So it looks like this. That's not very exciting. Right? I picked a very bad function to show you guys. When you wrote the domain and the range, yeah. and you put them in brackets, they have to be in brackets, they can't be in parentheses? Well, if that was an open circle, it would be parentheses, right? Okay. That's a closed circle, so I have to include it. So here, you guys try this one real quick. Let me show you one that's a little more impressive. Find this guy's inverse. Uh, let's see, Jeff.
Yes. We'll just go straight to this. It's not easy to see something here just because I picked it. Are those the increments of one? Yes, those are one. To be a little bit more interesting. I picked a bad example there. So. What does F do? It goes through what points? <coughs> negative one, negative four. Negative one, negative four. Zero, zero, two. Zero, two. Four, three. Four, three. So the inverse should go through negative, negative four, negative one. Two, zero. Two, zero. Three four. Three, four. So let's see, negative four, negative one is right there. Two zero is right there. Three four is right there. Do you see symmetry there somewhere? Do you see any symmetry? Where does the mirror look like it is? Do it in the air like that. Where does the mirror look like it is? Yeah, okay, cool. Most of us got that right. Let's see. Uh, so the mirror looks to be like right there. You guys kind of with me? See that? That's always going to be true. It kind of makes sense. If I switch the x and y, the graph flips over the y equals x line. This is the y equals x line. So you see why that one was kind of stupid of me to do. I wasn't even thinking. And when it flips, it almost goes right back on top of itself. It's not easy to see what's going on. This one's a little more interesting. When it flips, you can really see the symmetry really well. So it's going to flip across the y equals x line. All right. And if, if, uh, if I flip it and the result is still a function, are both of these lines functions? Is the black line a function? Is the purple line a function? Why? What, what's it mean to be a function? You've got to do what? Pass the vertical line test. They both pass the vertical line test. So when I flip it, it still passes the vertical line test, doesn't it? So it passed it to begin with, and this one still passes the vertical line test. So they're both functions. Yes? Could you draw y equals x on that one? Yeah. <laughs> this is a little bit harder to see. It's y equals x is going to be in the same place no matter what. Yeah. But you can see, you know, I have something that's already kind of like symmetric. It almost folds right back on itself. Right? That's why it's harder. It almost goes right back on itself. But you can see that little dip there on both sides. Oh, yeah, I see. All right. But it wasn't a really good choice for me, especially considering how poorly I draw. But it's still going to work, right? This is a little easier to see because it's going to flip around. You can really see it across from each other a little what better. Mean, what do you mean past the vertical line test? So in the homework, you should have hit a couple of places where they ask you, why is this a function? Why is this not a function? Because if you do a vertical line, it's If you do a vertical line, line yeah. So, anybody ever heard of the movie Highlander? Oh, yes. Highlander? Anybody? Even in Manhattan, I don't care. This is the this is the way I remember. Every X can have only one Y. There can only be one Y. So, if you've ever seen Highlander, you know where that line came from. So, every X can have only one output. So, if I draw a vertical line and it goes through more than once, that means that X has more than one output. So, to be a function, I have to say, what size shoe are you wearing in your left foot? You can only give me one answer. If you gave me more than one answer, what the hell is happening to you? <laughs> what is going on with you, right? You guys kind of with me? I don't care if you have two shoes on. The one that's on the inside is your shoe. The other one is just, I don't know, extra outside shoe safety. I don't know what that one is. You guys kind of with me? So, so functions actually make physical sense. If I throw a ball and I say, three seconds later, where is it? And you say, it's five feet up there and it's one foot down. What happened to the ball? Some samurai, wow, you with me? It can only be in one place. 
at one time. So functions are really math saying, this is what has to happen for it to make physical sense. That's why the vertical line is the check to see if it is a function. Is that ball in more than one place at one time? Holy shit, that's not a function. That can't happen. And for the test, we have to get it in the main range. Say again? No, you wouldn't have to. Domain and range is coming separate. So this guy, what's the domain and range for the purple line? What's the domain for the purple line? The purple line is made of 4 and 4. Nope. I don't get that. X. Domain is all about X values. What's the lowest X value you see the purple line using? Negative one. Negative one. Does it have negative two anywhere? No. Domain is X values. Have a little dude walk on the X axis. What's the first time he sees the purple line? At negative one. Okay, so the range would be negative four. Yes. So the domain is negative one up to? Four. Four. The range is? Yeah, negative four. Have him walking on the y-axis now, right? He sees it at negative four, and the last time he sees it is at three. Now, stay with me. What about the black line? What's the domain for the black line? Negative four. Negative four. Three. Three. Right? And the range is... For the black line, the range is negative one to four. Now, how do these relate? Beautiful. Because what does an inverse do? It takes the x and y values and flips them. It takes the output of the first guy and makes it the input and the output. They switch. So, of course, my domain and range are going to switch because domain of the x is the range of the y's. So, on one level, I really hope you understand if one function makes zero become two, its inverse is going to make two become zero again. It's going to undo what was done. Visually, beautiful. Symmetry, awesome. Kick ass. Domain and range. Switch. Makes sense. Right? Algebraically is the next step. How do I find a, an inverse algebraically? <clears throat> if somebody actually gives me a function, how do I find its inverse? Find inverse algebraic. <coughs> so given h of x equal x minus 3 cubed plus 4. I like it. How do I find this guy's inverse? Well, what I have to do is remarkably the same as what we did visually. What did we do visually to find the inverse? We took the x and y, we switched it, right? So where's the y in this equation? Four is four. There is a y. Good. That's y. <coughs> I don't know if you guys remember, that's function notation took the place of y a long time ago. No, no, no. All right, so now what you do is interesting. What I always do is, since I'm applying an idea, I'm not actually doing something algebra computationally. I always draw a little dotted line. And all I'm going to do is switch the x and y. Exactly what we do visually. Visually, we switch the x and y. Computationally, I'm going to switch the x and y. And what should the inverse function do? It should do all the opposite operations, right? right? So if I start to solve for y, if I take the original guy, I switch x and y, and I start to solve for y, am I not going to be doing all the opposite stuff? How do you solve this for y? What did you have to change the function? Or am I just going to... <coughs> They'll change as I solve. How do I solve this for y? Subtract 4, right? Cube root. See, I'm doing all the... The original guy had addition. What am I going to have? Subtraction. The original guy had a cube. What am I going to have? Cube root. So one last step, and we got it. Because it's a, uh, 
odd numbers doesn't have to be plus or minus? Odd numbers are laid back. But that's an excellent point. That's one reason why squares don't really work well with inverses. I'll talk about more in a second. What's the last step here? Add three. So I get y equals the cube root of x minus four plus three. And that's not a good place to stop. I started with h of x. What did we just figure out? Y. The inverse. The inverse. What symbol do I use for the inverse of h? H, negative 1. H inverse of x is this. That's the inverse of h. That's the opposite of h. Why is it the opposite? What does, a, what does this guy do first? If I plug a number in, what's the first thing I do to that number? If I plug a 7 in, what's the very first thing I'm going to do to that 7? Subtract 3, right? If I plug a 7 in, I'm going to subtract 3. What's the last thing this guy does? If I plug a 7 in, what's the last thing he's going to do? Add 3. That's the opposite of this. This guy first subtracts 3. This guy adds 3. This guy then cubes. This guy cube roots. This guy adds 4. This guy subtracts 4. You see how they're opposites of each other. Remarkably simple process to find the inverse function of anything. What I'm seeing when you started solving, it looks exactly the same. From up there, x minus 3, q plus 4. And you just said it to x with the same. Exactly. Of course it looks the same up here. Of course it does. Okay. Because I haven't solved it yet. Right? But compare this, what we, which h of x, to this. Yeah. So here it's going to look the same because all I did was switch the x and y. If I solve for y, I'm now going to undo all the operations that are in there. I'm going to end up with the collection of opposite operations. Okay, cool. So that's all you have to do is switch the x and y? Yes, that's it. That's so Why does it make sense? Because visually it makes sense. So why the hell shouldn't it work algebraically? Visually, what do we do? We switch the x and y. So here I'm going to switch the input and the output. Now, I don't normally have things solved for x, so I solve for y, and what I end up with has got to be the opposite of what I had in the beginning. Because it's going to have all the opposite operations in it. Because when I solve, I apply opposite operations. Right? So here, you guys do this. Find, so given, um, give you a function, you do exactly what we just did. Given f of x equal to, oh, what you got you? Let's try this. 2x minus 4 over 5. Find f inverse.
again, that, uh, you, you won't see other teachers do that. It's just my own thing. I like to draw that line because I did not do anything truly algebraic from here to here. Right? There's no way to just make... Oh! So I applied an idea from here to there. So a little line just reminds me. From here to there, I didn't do anything freaky. I just applied an idea. Switch them. So once you're there, you're golden. What do you do from there? Yeah, you solve for y. So the worst part about it is the stupid fractional piece, so kill that first. Right? So multiply by 5. So get 5x equals 2y minus 4. Add the 4. 5x plus 4 equals 2y. Divide by 2. So I get f inverse is 5x plus 4 divided by 2. Why does that make sense? Because this guy multiplies by 5, this guy divided. This guy adds 4, this guy this guy divides by 2, this guy multiplies by 2. So you can't further simplify from there? Like the... Yeah, you could break them up, sure. You could do that. It'll just be harder to see that what I just did. But you certainly could break these up and make it 5x over 2 plus 2. Okay. That's cool. But then it's a little harder to point out what I just pointed out. But it's right. It's fine. You could do that. I like it. Well, we could just leave it that way. Totally. So, follow up on that. Uh, what is f of... Uh, you can do it, Jeff. What is f of 3? You'll like this. On the, on the what's f of 3? Not in the inverse, right? I didn't say what's f inverse. I said what's f of 3? Yeah. 6 minus 4 is 2 over 5. So what is f inverse of 2 over 5 going to have to be? 5 over 2. No. 3. What did f do to 3? It made it become 2 fifths. So what's the inverse going to do to 2 fifths? Make it go back to? Three. 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 Kick ass. Inverse does not mean reciprocate. Inverse means whatever the hell it was doing, the inverse is going to do the opposite. And this, did, this didn't reciprocate, did it? Did all this multiplication and addition and stuff. Oh, I just killed you somewhere. Okay. And let's check it now. Let's plug it in. Five times two fists plus four over two. What's five times two fists? Four. Two plus four. Two. Plus 4 over 2 is 6 over 2 is 3. Kick ass. I didn't have to do that work, but I just did it just to make sure it was true. Yes, of course it's true. Do you guys see that? On the test, what do you have to do the work? How do you mean? If you ask. If I ask, yes. No, like if you ask for... No, now if I just said... Now sometimes I'll give you this. I'll give you a problem, like exactly... Like, I won't even tell you any functions. I'll just say, you know that g of 8... You know g of 8 equals uh, 2.3. So what's g inverse of 2.3? 8, 8. 8. All right, so don't let that be a hard problem. You know it's coming. <laughs> it's going to be that simple. But they always have people come up and say, did you mean to give us a function? Nope, sure didn't. Nope, I don't have to. No, nah, no. Nah. Right? Because it's simple. The idea of an inverse is so simple that if you're like trying to make it more complicated, you know, it can't be that simple. But whatever one function does to something, the inverse will undo it. This made 8 become 2.3. This is going to make 2.3 go back to 8. Kick ass. So let's talk real quick about squared stuff, for example, just to start with an example that there is no inverse. Uh, do you see how I have to know where something came from? to be able to go back to what it was. So if I square 2, that's 4, right? But if I square, what else? I'll get 4. Negative 2. Negative 2. So if I have f of x is x squared, and I say, OK, f of 2 is 4, what's f inverse of 4? Why can't you just say 2? Because it could have been negative 2, right? There's two ways to get to the output of 4, isn't it? There's more than one way. 
2 goes to 4, but so does negative 2. So let me show you kind of a nice visual for that. Um, So D is like the domain. So for this example, I only have two inputs, don't I? And I only have one output. So both 2 and negative 2 go to 4. Do you see what I'm saying? So if I want to say, is there an inverse? No, because there's more than one way I can try to go back. Right? That's why detective work is so hard. There's more than one possibility. To, to be where I'm seeing, there's more than one way to get there. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. <laughs> So for your answer, would it be plus or minus 2, or do you have to... Mm -mm, no, uh, this does not exist. Because there's got to be one answer, and can there be one answer? No, there's two possibilities. Oh. So whenever there's two answers, there's... Two exactly. Answers. So, a much better, quicker way to realize this. What does a parabola look like? It looks like this. So for an output of 4, where could a 4 come from? It could come from more than one place. So that looks like if I have a function, a graph, and I say, is that have an inverse? You do a, oh shit, horizontal line test. Oh shit. If I do a horizontal line test, I'll see, does this output have more than one place to come from? So you remember that the, the one I had us do the inverse for is being very careful about always just going up. <coughs> I've got to always be going up there. Of course, I didn't do it. I gotta always be going up so that it doesn't come back on itself, right? So we call this kind of function a one-to-one -one function. Notice this two only goes to four, right? So that's at least one way it works, but four goes back to negative two and two. So to be invertible, you have to be called an, you have to be uh, something that's called one-to-one. -one. Two goes to four, and four can only go back to two. One to one. This guy's not one to one. Because two goes to four, but so does negative two goes to four. Oh shit, it's more than one thing that comes to four. It's no good. So you can't invert it. So the answer would be no solution or what? Would the answer be no solution if we ever got Yeah, no inverse, not invertible. Yeah. No, no inverse. yeah, no inverse exists. Good. So um, for example, one like um, f sixteen. So okay. negative four. Oh, okay, sure. So sixteen four. has two places it comes from. But so it's not the square. only. This function and this function has so no. So I think that pretty much is square. Inverse. inverse. Any function that does this, why would that not have an inverse? Because right here, it has more than one thing that can go to that output. So if this output is seven, this goes to seven, this goes to seven, and this goes to seven. So if I saw some dude, this dude is huge, and I go, man, he must work out a lot. Is that necessarily true? Is it the only way to become huge? No, you could just have really good genes. My little brother never works out. It's a monster. Never works out a day in his life. Never. You just had the genes. You kind of with me? If I see something, is there only one way to have gotten there? Normally not. Right? You are here. So you must have driven here. You could have taken a bus. You could have went to somebody else. You could have walked. Do you guys kind of see what I'm saying? So that's not an invertible function. I see the situation as it is now. Can I work back to what made it happen? If I can't, that's not invertible. I can't reverse it. That's why a parabola, or this kind of thing, if I see a 7, where could that have come from? This guy or this guy. Oh, shit, I can't go backwards, so that's not invertible. That's why this horizontal, horizontal line test makes sense. This tells me if it's invertible, if it's one-to-one. -one. Because that'll tell me, is there more than one way to get to that output? If there is, there's no inverse. I can't go backwards. So I'm putting more than one answer. Hmm? What's wrong with putting more than one answer down for the inverse? For a function, any function, oh, yeah, <clears throat> any function has got to have a specific answer to it. So if I'm saying that this is a function, it's got to have an answer for seven. It can't have multiple answers. So that's why earlier I like if somebody was asking, do you have to put a plus or minus? Mm -hmm. 
So if I'm trying to find this guy's, and I'm all over the damn place. If I'm trying to find this guy's inverse here, I would switch x and y, and then what would I do? Square root it. And what, the minute I do that, I have to put, oh shit, and that tells me it's not invertible because there's one, two answers there. Is this, is this one function? No, it's two functions. It's this function and that function. There are two function. Oh shit, there's not an inverse. There are like two inverses, so it's no good. So is that true though when anything is square? There is no... Yes. Unless. But Unless. you can also come from 2 and 8. Yeah, but no, this is specifically a square function, right? So it can only come from 4. Or negative 4. Okay. So yeah. pretty much all the squares can be inverse. Or 4 powers or any anything that goes back on like itself. All anything mm -hmm. even. Yeah, any even power thing, but also any function that goes back on itself, and there are more yeah. functions than that. Oh, yeah. But yeah, that's what we know. Uh, shit, I just lost what I was going to do. Anything squared does not have an inverse. Except. Oh. So parabola normally looks like this, right? Mm -hmm. Does that pass the horizontal line test? What if I eliminate that part of it? Yeah. Yeah. What if I say x has got to be greater than equal to zero? Yeah. Now it has an inverse, right? In fact, that inverse, let me see if you guys can handle this. If I draw the mirror, the mirror we were talking about earlier, right? Is that cool? That's the symmetry mirror that is symmetric. It's going to flip around that mirror, right? If I flip it, it becomes this. And what function is that? That's the square root function. Kick ass. So if I restrict the domain, if I say it only works for x's that are bigger than or equal to zero, then that would pass the horizontal line test. There would be an inverse. So if you're out there like I was when I first learned this, like, but I know the square root's the opposite of square. Shit, what the hell are you talking about? Yes, if you say this, then it's officially true. So I guess I might realize I can cut the other half out too and it would still work. All right, that's exceptionally freaky. But what do you have to worry about? You have to worry about these kind of things. I'm going to give you a, a function and I'm going to ask you to draw its inverse. Is that easy or hard? It's easy. If you know the points that this goes through, and it's going to be a function that I'm going to have the computer draw, so it'll be even easier to tell what points it goes through, <laughs> then you just have to go through the opposite points. Just flip the x and y, right? Mm -hmm. So algebraically, how do you find the inverse? Same thing. It's beautiful. All you got to remember is switch the x and y. That's how you find an inverse. Visually, it's how you find the inverse. You switch the x and y, and then you graph it. Algebraically, you switch the x and y, and then you solve for y, right? Because switching the x and y is the first step to finding the inverse. Cool. Yes, ma'am. I understand the first part of the graph with x squared, one, x squared, one. Six, how two. Is, uh, how is that x squared if it's only half of the... Because I'm saying that the domain is this. It's forcing the restriction. So if I say f of x equals x squared, x squared equal to zero. I'm restricting the domain. And we do this all the time. Uh, um, if I had uh, age of a fish and how long it is, right? As a fish, as the fish gets older, it gets longer to a certain point. Thankfully, it doesn't go forever up or else you have the fish that swallow Manhattan or something, right? You got you with me? Yeah. But I'm, obviously, is there any negative age? Math would go, oh, there's a whole other piece to that, but negative one years? No, so we say, no, 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 the domain is known t greater equal to zero. We do that, we don't even write it down because it's just so known. But that's really what we're doing. We're saying it's only works for time greater than zero. We're like, yeah. Before that, the fish did not exist. So, hey, does that make sense? Yeah. So that can totally happen. I'm not going to focus too much on that because that's a little bit extra. So this section is all about f of h of x, that kind of stuff, composition of functions, putting one function inside of another one, uh, and then finding inverses, right? Switch the x and y to find the inverse. And then also identifying if something's invertible, if something is one. So if you see them say, is this one to one? That really is saying, is it invertible? And to be invertible, you can't do, this looks good, this looks good, this looks good, oh shit. <laughs> It can't go back on itself that way, right? That won't be invertible. It can't go backwards. 
horizontal line test. Okay, HLT. Ham lettuce tomato. I have a question. Yeah. If they give you something like this, I know that's not one to one, right? But the way to say it is, to solve this, I'd have to put plus or minus. So there's not a single answer, right? Yeah, so any squares, any even powers, is this one to one? Is that one to one? Hell no, right? It's an even power. It's not going to pass the horizontal line test. Cool. I like it. I like it. All right. So let me do uh, uh, such hopes I have for this incredibly truncated time we have together. Um, let's see what's going to make the most sense. I am going to do, uh, all right, so I'm not going to do 14.3. We'll do 14.3 after this. We'll do it on Wednesday. I mean, Thursday. Um, I am going to do 14.2. And then the rest of the time will be devoted to review for the test tomorrow. Wait, don't we have a test tomorrow? We have a test tomorrow. I thought it was Thursday. Thursday, no, no. Thursday's, we are going to study Thursday's the review for the final. Okay. Yeah. Wednesday's the test. So that I can grade it by Thursday, so you have it to look over before the final on Friday. Okay. It's on the date sheet. Okay. Yeah. Are we going to uh, add anything tomorrow? What's that? Are we going to do anything? No, I don't lecture on test days because your brain will be fried. Um, and I always thought it was evil for a teacher to do new stuff right before test on older stuff. You like you're packing new stuff in, and then I, yeah, so I don't do that. Although if I did, I'd get through all the material. Yay! You guys would all die. Oh. Um, uh, so logs are going to come. We'll talk about logarithms on Thursday. Oh, yes. Uh, but today I want to talk about this, and this is not going to be nearly as, as ugly, believe it or not. Um, these are called exponential functions. I feel like I've talked about these a little Just bit already. Quick, yes. So the log stuff that's on the quiz re or the test review yeah. tomorrow. When no. we get to the review, I'll point out which problems you got to worry about. Yeah, so all the log stuff is out for the test. They will be on the final, but they're off for the test tomorrow. Um, so we've had variables uh, underneath stuff. We had variables inside of stuff. We had variables uh, under radicals. We've had variables. <laughs> all over the damn place, right? The one place we haven't done yet is something like this, where variables themselves are the powers. So this is 2 to the x power. So the first thing I want to ask you is, is what do you think the domain is of this? And the way to ask yourself that is, is there any restriction on what I can raise to 2? Is there any number I can't raise to 2? 